Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, good to see you. Hope you all had a good week. Let's uh, stand up and join Brother David in some hymns tonight. Hey, Jamie, fly. Please open our service in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for blessing us with another day of being in your house. We give you all our glory and honor to be here. We thank you for all the blessings you show in the church here. May you continue to guide us and lead us and have us run the church the way you would have it be around. May you bless the blessing we hear today, here tonight, take it to heart. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You can be seated. Come over to Big Blunders.
never yet been told. How much more can tell how it waves a glory roll. It is like the great or flowing well springing up within my soul. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory. Full of glory, it is joy unspeakable and full of glory, oh, that has, has never yet been told. Let's do one more, Dave. Page 345. Once again, for coming out to the house of the Lord tonight, uh, we have uh, much to be prayerful about. Miss Bev Varney contacted me and said they found, I think, eleven polyps in Chuck, and so they're going to make up a plan. She's waiting to find out they're going back home now and wait to hear from them on what they plan to do. But I sure that we'd be praying for them. So remember, uh, Chuck and Miss Bev. Uh, Marcy's mom and dad are still at their place in Kentucky. And they had a terrible tragedy. Their uh, neighbor lives behind them. Their 14-year-old son committed suicide this week. And so uh, they've been trying to minister to the family and help them. And uh, so please remember that family. I know they're really heartbroken. Someone else with a prayer request you'd like to share tonight? Yes, Ms. Donna? My husband, Steve, asked for prayer. And I said, what do you need? He said, I have to work. <laughs> And he will pray for Steve. You know, he always says, the doors are open, he's going to be here. Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, Ms. Uh, Julie? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, one, my job's not looking good. Um, the news said this morning that 
then they're going to file Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And of course, around the holidays, you know, things aren't looking good. Mm -hmm. Just we pray that we can pick ourselves up and everything. And another sure. one on the lighter side, I had a couple really good friends of mine that had a baby this morning. Oh, oh great. So, little boy, name Elliot. <laughs> we'll pray for that family. And we'll pray for you guys. We sure will, Miss Jackie. Uh, that's what I was going to ask for prayer for. Okay. It worked. <laughs> Miss Tina? It's prayer for Ron. He needs to find him a dentist. <laughs> we will. He can't find a dentist to get that people. Sure, we sure will. We will. Somebody else? Miss Deb? He's um, thinking in prayer. Mm -hmm. He's got a lot of um, health issues, as you know. Right. But she's got a lot of appointments this week, too. So. Amen. We'll pray. We'll pray. Somebody else go south? Yeah, Brother Joe, you heard anything about Brother Rick? Hot? Really hot? I did. I talked to uh, Sue Monday. I was going to go visit him, and she said that he has a hard time communicating right now. It'd probably be better to wait a little while before she has company. But he was, um, uh, his, his uh, Speaking ability improved just just a little bit, not a lot. But he still had trouble moving, so he's going to be in for some therapy, uh, pretty good wild therapy, it sounds like. I told her I'd check back with him early next week. So, thank thank you for bringing him. I'm sure I want to remember Roy. Yep. Yeah. Yes, Miss Janet. Johnny and and uh, yes. Jojo and you Yes. And Mary. Good. Yep. Yeah, Miss Johnny. She, you know the all that she's been through was sure showing on her last time she was here and. Mike and Brent said that uh, JoJo had therapy and just wore out from her therapy today. So, mm -hmm. it will. Yes, Donna. Uh, can we first keep uh, Dorothy's sister Isabel in prayer? Mm -hmm. She right. joined us, her mm -hmm. and her sister-in-law, mm -hmm. for our ladies' luncheon. Very sweet, very heartbroken over the loss of her husband. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Yes. That's what prayer is all about. That's why we do it. Yes. Too. There's still a lot of bitterness out there and everything. Uh, there's a lot of people that are separating from their families and everything because of what happened. I wish we people can just, you know, unite. unite. Yeah. Yes. And just, you know, be mature. Mm -hmm. and just say, hey, can the bygones be bygones? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not the end of the world. Yes. Yes. Good, good request, Miss Julie. Any others? I appreciate your prayers for Jacob. He's doing good. Can be, can be expected and prayers really help. So, all those with an unspoken request can share that by raising your hand. And uh, Brother Silas, would you ask God to bless our prayer request for us tonight, please? God, thank you for another day. Thank you for another day of life, Lord. Thank you for all the good things you've done for us in the past. The good things that's coming up, Lord, that we know you're going to do for us. Mm -hmm. Now, these requests that are made tonight, Lord, you know how to answer them, Lord. We just Ask that you help the doctors make the right decisions and yes. the right tools to work with the Lord. Mm -hmm. A lot of people out there are hurting. Mm -hmm. Just uh, reach out and touch it. Your will be done, Lord. Ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Silas. Uh, Brother Bill, you want to sing for us tonight? <coughs>
If I surveyed all the good things come to me from above, count all my blessings in the storehouse of love, I simply ask for a favor of him beyond more looking.
salvation can lead me home. What joy shall fill my heart when I shall bow in humble get mad at me once for letting them out earlier than usual. So, If you want to flip your Bibles over, I'm going to be hop, hopping around some, but we'll start in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. I'll probably read this familiar story to you. I'll start reading in verse 5. And I've just been, I mentioned Sunday we would do something about prayer and I just, these scriptures have come to my mind and just want to talk a little bit about the role of faith in prayer. And so uh, the Bible has a lot to say about that. I just scratched the surface, but I'm going to try and share some of these things with you. And if you have questions or examples to share, please feel free and do that as we go through this. Father, we come before you tonight thankful for our church family Thankful for a good, warm building to come together and study and worship in. Thankful for the warm hearts of your people that gather around together here. And I pray that you would bless our time of study uh, and worship tonight, Lord. That you would just help us to grow as Christians, Lord. And to be better prepared to serve you and be a light and a witness in our, in our homes, in our communities, in our workplaces. And I pray you'd add your blessings to our church tonight and in the days that lie ahead, Lord. That uh, we could be a place where lost souls could be feel the love of God and come to know you, Lord, and we can all grow our faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in verse 5 it says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but I speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said unto them, or said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. So this man that was... Uh, bringing his uh, servant's situation to Jesus was a centurion. So what, what, what does that tell us about him? So someone that was a centurion was probably a probably Roman, right? A yeah. Um, and uh, he knew where to go. He must have had great compassion for his servant. And isn't it interesting what Jesus said, that I've not found so great a faith not even in Israel. That's what this man had. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty strong accolade to give somebody. If you look at all of Israel, and I've not found anyone in all of Israel that's got faith like this. But you think about what he said. You see, he, he talked about like the chain of command. He's, he was one in authority. And he said, you know, to the people that have fall under me in the chain of command, I, I tell them to go there and they go there. And I tell them to, to go here and they go here. Um, and they tell them to do this, and they do that. And, and what I see is this centurion had heard enough about Jesus, had, had, had 
confidence enough in Jesus that whatever was wrong, and I think the policy is what was wrong with his servant, uh, uh, whatever was wrong with his servant, he figured Jesus could do that to the illness just the same way that he could command his troops. Jesus could say, be healed. Jesus could say, leave him alone. Jesus could say, get out of him, Paul, see, whatever that it was. And, um, and you say, well, let's go ahead and read now the next couple of verses. And, and verse 11, Jesus said, and I say unto you that, well, let's skip those two. Those don't really apply. Go down to 13. And it says, and Jesus said unto the centurion, go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. So the centurion expressed this great faith they had in Jesus and compared his command as, as, a, uh, as an officer in, in, the, uh, in the military, compared that to what Jesus could do uh, to somebody that would go to him for their needs. And, uh, and so now he tells, this, he tells this centurion, as you believe, as you believe. So what happened if the, what happened if the centurion only, only believed about this much? Wasn't going to receive too much healing. You know, so I mean, it, it's, it's very common sense, but it's something I really have to think about a lot. Uh, I've sure thought about this a lot since Jacob got his diagnosis. Right. You know, how, how, what do we believe? I mean, it's one thing to say God can do all things, but when you're getting ready to go to him and you're getting ready to ask him for something, it's something else that, you know, to, to ask for, uh, for whatever that your need is, to, to save a lost soul, to heal somebody that's sick, to intervene in a and a really bad uh, relationship problem, whatever that the need is, what do we believe? And, and clearly Jesus told this man here who really understood what it meant. Uh, he said, as you believe, so shall it be. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Those aren't the exact words, but that's what he was getting at. And so see that we never have to doubt what God's able to do, right? We, we, we don't have to doubt what God's able to do, but the other part of that equation is us, is us. And so there's, there are several places, if you flip over with me, if you want to, to uh, Mark chapter, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 9. Just flip over one, one chapter and let's look at another situation where uh, this comes into play. Mark chapter 9, let's read at verse 27. Mark or Matthew? I'm sorry, Matthew. Okay. Mark is after this one. Matthew right now, Matthew okay. chapter 9. Thank you, Miss Deb. And so this is a story about the two blind men. It says in verse 27, And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. When he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto him, Believe ye that I am able to do this? That sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? And if the blind men didn't believe, it probably would have turned out a whole lot different. And that just really speak, it just really speaks to me because our belief, our faith in what Jesus can do, our faith in what Jesus is able to do really impacts our, the power we have in our prayer life. And they said to him, Yea, Lord, then, um, then touched he their eyes, and he said, According to your faith, be it unto you. According to your faith, be it unto you. And you see... Uh, they were healed. They were able to see. And then one more. If you, now you flip over to Mark. I really mean it this time. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And this is a story here about the um, demonic son. And, and he, he comes to Jesus and he tells Jesus that his son is possessed of a demon and often he trips and falls and he gnashes at the mouth and foams at the mouth and all, you know, has all these problems with this son that's uh, possessed of a, of a bad spirit. And uh, let's start reading verse 21. And it says, and Jesus asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child or since he was, or since he was, hi Marco, good to see you. And it says, of a child, or since he was a child. And it says, and oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help him, or help us. And Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. You kind of sensing a theme here? You know, 
If you can believe, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears. So you, you put yourself in this father's position and, and he's, probably tried, he's probably tried all manner of things to get his son help and not have got any help for his son. And his son had been less since he was a child and probably for many years and how you know, he had to watch his son and, and protect his son and, and uh, be there for his son. He was going to hurt himself and just looking for any ounce of hope. And when, when, Jesus, uh, when Jesus told him, um, if thou canst believe all things are possible, can you imagine the, the doors that opened up in his mind? Can you imagine the hope and the possibility that probably flooded in where there was no hope at all before? And, um, and he cried out. And he said, Lord, I believe. And Brother Locklear, whenever they would pray uh, over somebody at Woodhaven, whenever they would anoint somebody, he always said this, didn't he, Miss Marcy? He'd always say, Lord, we believe, but help thou our unbelief. And that's where it comes from. And so the, the father believed, but if there's a part of him that wasn't believing, he was so compelled to, to, to get his son to help that he needed, he's like, Lord, then help the parts of me that don't believe. And, and that's, that's, that's what we need. That's what we'll... I think improve our prayer lives so we'll strengthen our prayer lives because there's parts of us that don't always in our faith isn't always perfect at least mine is it's not always perfect there's there's some things that seem sometimes too big there's some things that seem uh, too uh, too far gone there's some situations that almost seem hopeless and or insurmountable and and but but with God all things are possible and that's what he told this man here and heaven if, if you look around haven't you seen enough situations where God's done the impossible in the past that's right. we have so if God has done that in the past and he's still working that, today, that way today, God really hasn't changed. So you see what the variable in the equation is? Is us. Mm-hmm. Is us. And I think our, our, the, the strength of our belief is what the variable is. And so we prayed, uh, Lord, I believe, but please help my unbelief. Mm-hmm. And we know that if, if you go on and read the rest of the story, that the demon was cast out and... and, and uh, the child was made, made whole. And then I want to go to John 14 and read a couple of scriptures here. But I really am trying to get to a point. Just bear with me. John chapter 14. Tom's favorite chapter here. I heard you back there, Tom. John 14 verse 12 says, Verily, verily, so why, why does Jesus say verily twice in a verse? It's important. It's important. If he tells you verily once, it's all, anything Jesus says is important. If he adds verily to it, it's important. If he adds verily, verily to it, it's very important. Yes. He put that in her just for Deb when she was distracted to get your attention, Miss Deb. <laughs> verily, verily, Deb. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Um, you mean, he that, if we believe on Jesus, we can do greater works than him? Because he goes to be with his Father. Well, what happens when he goes to be with his Father? The Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit comes, and now we have an intercessor. Now we have a, a go-between, if you will, between us and God. That, that's Jesus. He says, you, um, verse 13 says, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I uh, do, that the Father may be glorified. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Tell me, what does that leave? Dave and I talked about this, I don't know, a year, year and a half, two years ago. What does that leave out? If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Nothing. It doesn't. So there's nothing. That, so we have to pray in Jesus' name. We, we can't pray in Buddha's name. We can't pay, pray in any other name, but we pray in Jesus' name. Um, he told the Father before, all things are possible if you believe. And here he says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And so I remember when Dave and I were talking about that, and I, I was looking within myself saying, well, what's wrong with me? 
how come I'm not getting through more and better? So you know what? It's right. the problem is never with God. <laughs> the problem is never with God. When, if if you don't seem to have the power that you that you hoped you would have with your prayer life, then the place to go is in God's Word in front of the mirror. It really is because the problem is not with God. And so when I was thinking about um, uh, our faith and how that obviously how strong our belief is in what God's able to do has a lot to do with, with the fruitfulness of our, of our prayer life. That, that, that's just common sense. And I think these, these scriptures here um, bear that out. But I was thinking throughout the Old Testament, it's not called this in the Old Testament, but a lot of scholars call them these things. There was various times during the Old Testament where God had delivered for the children of Israel. And in the face of him delivering, uh, either God instructing them to or the people felt led to create a memorial to memorialize how God had delivered them. And a lot of times they call, they use stones and they call them, the scholars will call them um, memorial stones. So if you were to look and you don't have to turn if you don't want, but in Genesis chapter 28, we've been studying about Jacob and Esau. We, when, when Jacob went to, I think it was called Luz before, and he made a pillow out of stones, and he fell asleep, and he had the dream about Jacob's ladder, and, and uh, he saw people descending and ascending the ladder, going up into heaven and coming down, and he said, this is none other but the house of God, and, and he woke up, and he was refreshed, and he was relieved, and, and he, took those, uh, he took those stones, uh, he, was, he was Abraham and Isaac's promises were passed on to him from, from God, and he took those stones he used, and he made, he made a monument there to God, and he, and he called that place... Uh, Bethel, which I think means the house of God. And, and I, you know, I don't know exactly why he built that monument. He wanted to honor God, memorialize God, but I'm sure he wanted to, if he ever came back by there again, if he looked at those stones, it would remind him of how God delivered him from a difficult time and difficult circumstances. And one of, the, one of the ways I think that we can improve the power we have in our prayer life is, is to be used these memory stones, is, is to, to reach back into our minds and think about what God's, you know, if, if I can think about how God raised me up from that, that heart attack I had, God can do anything. He can do anything. If I think about what God's doing in Brother Rich's life, you see, not long before Rich got his diagnosis, David Hines, me, me and Miss Marcy went to church with the Hines family at the Belleville Church, and uh, Pam was uh, my age. I went to high school with her. She was a piano player. Her mom loved to sing. And David Hines was, uh, to be truthful, he was a very uh, rugged and very um, hyper <laughs> young boy. He would wear you out at church. I, that's how I remember him. And when I started coming to church here, I thought he was here. The first Easter service I preached, he was here. Sister Hines' son, he had his own family. And, and then his father-in-law, it's Paul Compton, he was one of the, I think, one of the original deacons of the church. And he's the guy that calls me at least once a week to see how the church is doing. He asks how his daughters are doing. He wants to know if they're in church. He's checking on them. He always says he's praying for the church. Uh, when the church started growing, he gave Mar Marcy some money and to me and said, go buy that pastor a new suit. Uh, just a sweet, sweet, sweet man. And so, um, uh, uh, now, I forgot how I was tying him into this, to this point. Um, oh, I know, about Brother Rich and Miss Debbie. So, uh, David Hine and his wife, they moved out, uh, out the other side of Tecumseh. It's out there a pretty good way. Silas and I go right by that when we go hunting a lot of times to her house. That's where we stopped that time, Silas, and dropped off that pillow for him. He was, he, guess what? He got diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and adrenal gland cancer. Does that sound familiar? Yes. We went to visit him, and he was, uh, me and Marcy did, and he was not doing too good, but he was, he was sure singing the praises of God. And if he had never got right before, he was sure right then because he knew that things didn't look too good, and for whatever reason, God didn't seem fit to heal him. And the day that Rich announced his diagnosis, his wife was sitting right there. And when Rich said that, her heart sank to the floor. Amen. So... Obviously, there's some faith in Rich's prayers, and there's some faith in Debbie's prayers, and I'm sure all the churches, when we got together and prayed for Rich, there's, there's faith, and we believe. And 
So when we look back over our lives, we need to really create some of these stones ourselves. So, you know, make some memories. Don't forget. When you face future challenges, don't forget what God's done for you in the past. Amen. And if you can't think of something he's done for you, then go to somebody else. Think of something right. he's done for somebody else. Because God is a, is a great God. He's a great God. I, I can think about uh, different things in my childhood that didn't go well, that caused me very much trouble in my childhood. And God took us through every one of those situations, every one of those situations. And, and I can think about, uh, I told you once here, one time I allowed Joey to drive back a tractor off of a trailer, a, a, a ride mower tractor, and the thing flipped over on him. Could have hurt him terribly bad. Didn't even get a scratch. Yeah. Didn't even get a scratch. So we, we need, to, I told you about the time that Jacob, uh, that Caleb was running through a church uh, uh, carnival down in Dearborn and a wild guy started running through shooting, shot a pistol full of shells, could have easily killed my son. Didn't, didn't, Caleb didn't get a scratch on him. That's not coincidence, friends. Yeah. That's a, a faithful God. Yeah. And so we need to remember uh, situations where God has delivered in the times in the past and and maybe we need to make some, some sort of memorial. Maybe we need to write a note in a book or put a, put a, you know, my mom was uh, famous for writing little reminders and sticking them on our refrigerator or sticking them on our cabinets or sticking them on the bathroom mirrors. Sometimes maybe we need to surround ourselves with some of these uh, uh, milestones and some of these uh, uh, reminders of what God has done and what he's capable of doing. Um, let's, let's run to Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4, I want to read verses 1 through 6. It says, And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take ye twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man. So how many tribes were in Israel? 12. So he says, get a man out of every tribe. I want every tribe represented here. And, and what were they getting ready to do here? Anyone know the context of the story? I'm battle well, well, they're getting ready to cross Jordan and, and go into the promised land here. And that was coming, Dave. Yeah? And so it says, take 12 men out of the people, out of every tribe of man, and command ye them, saying, take ye hence out of the midst of Jordan. So, so Jordan is this river, and that's what lay between them and the promised land. And they had to get across the river, and they had to cross the river with the ark, and all the people, and all the children, they had to take all of Israel across the river. And he says, get you, get you a man out of every tribe, and put him in the midst of the river, in the middle. Well, probably what's, it, the deepest part of the river is probably right in the middle of the river. He told him to grab a, and he's going to tell him here, he says, um, Take you out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. So every family, every tribe is represented, and each man of each tribe is to grab one of these stones, not just any stone, a stone from the middle of the river, and place this stone, leave them in the lodging place, leave them where you sleep tonight. Then in verse 4 it says, And Joshua called the twelve men whom he had pre prepared of the children of Israel out of every man a tribe. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. So see what he's telling them to do. Every tribe pick one. The one that's picked go to the middle of the river. Put it down where you sleep tonight. And then carry that because we're going to make a monument. We're going to make a memory stone, it says here. It says in verse 6, why? That this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean ye by these stones? And if you read the story, I don't know how big the Jordan was, but it was a big enough river it gave them pause about crossing over. And so they uh, didn't remember what happened. How did they get across on dry land? The river was flowing and he stopped it. It says the water just piled up in a heap. Can you imagine river, you know, the water flows one way in a river and all of a sudden it's just piling up in a heap. I don't, I, that's hard for me to fathom, but it happened. That's not, that's not a, 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 a figurative story here. This is a literal story here. The water piled up in a heap and the people went across and he said, take a stone 
out of the middle of the river and make this monument. And I want to be a sign among you that when your children, uh, when your ch- fathers, when your children walk by this, they can say, why are these stones here? And you can tell them, this is when God, <laughs> this is when God held the water up. This is when God allowed the children of Israel, the ark, the children, the families, all to cross over, held the waters up till we got to the other side, and then released the water so they could flow again. And don't, don't you think a lot of families are really hurting today because they don't got stones like that? Amen. Miss Marcy has talked about several times about the time her, was it your grandmother or great-grandmother? Tell them real quickly about that, Miss Marcy. Uh, it was my mom's grandmother, so my great-grandmother lived in a mining camp. And um, she was known for, you know, praying, serious praying. And so uh, their family didn't have plenty to eat. They had uh, part of a meal, and she needed bread for her family to go with the beans that she had made. And she got behind the door, and she prayed, and they said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm praying that the Lord's going to send us bread for our meal. And uh, a little dog came through the town. She went out on the porch to wait for God to answer her prayer. And a little dog came through with a cone of bread, laid it on her porch, and walked away. No one had seen the dog ever before. They never saw the dog again. Yeah. Neighbors said, you're not going to eat that food. The dog brought that bread. And she said, yes, I am. The Lord sent this. That's right. And, uh, yeah, no one ever saw that dog again. So she knew God yeah. had uh, sent that. So see, that's a very simple little story. But unless you lived in those hard depression era times, you couldn't, you couldn't really identify with that. Things are expensive now, but we got food now. It's just expensive. It was hard to come by food back then. Yeah. So that story has been passed down and passed down. And you know what? God bless your grandmother for doing that, Miss Marcy. She created a stone. Mm-hmm. And now look at all the people in your family that know about that. And we've got to be sure our boys, and we've got to be sure that Jacob and Leah and, and Reagan know about that. And I want, my, I want my children, if they ever see tough times, I want them to look back to the time when God brought their dad back from death. I want them to look at that. God, God is able. And so I think one of the problems in our world today, uh, certainly in the world, and I'm afraid one of the problems in our churches today is even, even us, we're, we're not doing a good enough job of, of stacking these stones up so that the people understand and see and know how good that God is and what He's doing. Because God is good and He knows what He's doing. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, there's a story where the, uh, the Israelites were under a serious attack from the Philistines. And the Philistines were always giving them problems, right? This, this was another of those examples. Always giving them problems in 1 Samuel chapter 7. I won't read the scriptures, but God delivered there in a mighty way. And after God delivered, Samuel commemorates this victory that God provided by erecting a stone figure. And he called that stone figure uh, Ebenezer. And Ebenezer, I guess, was uh, slain for the stone of help. So he wanted, you know, he wanted the rest of the children of Israel to go by that and see that stone and say, what, maybe they carved Ebenezer on it, I don't know. But to see what it was, the stone of health, and they could ask, well, just exactly what did, what did God do here? Well, we, we were about to be overtaken by the Philistines. We were, the future of Israel was in doubt here, and God delivered. And God delivered. And Boy, I can think of so many situations and so many times that God has delivered right here in our church. Right here in our church. And so, these, these I guess that's kind of what I wanted to share. You, you see the, the value of our belief and the value of our faith and what God's able to do. And to the extent that our faith suffers, I believe it's not that God's being mean or anything to us, but if we expect Him to deliver, we need to have faith and believe. And if we find our faith is wavering sometimes, we can look back at some of these stones. And, and if there's not enough stones around, guess what? Me and you need to start stacking. We really need to start stacking. That, that, that's not too much to ask of us to stack a few stones. You know, ask somebody what God's done for them. Since I've been pastor here, you would not believe some of the stories that people have told me. I, there, there was a... What was the fellow, Miss Marcy, he lived over on Farm Road, uh, Watson... Lord Watson, and we went to visit him. He was really sick, and then he went to uh, one of the nursing homes, and he passed away, but uh, he told us a, a story about how the, he was in a, a hospital in Europe. He was in, a, in the army, and he was not doing well, and, and basically he said how God came to visit him in the form of an angel right there in the hospital, right. and all of a sudden his health turned around just like that. And our old uh, song leader, Adrian, told me about how that Jesus came to visit him he said, I, I'm embarrassed to tell people because nobody will believe me. And we're over at his house talking, and, 
And before he'll tell me, he's like, <laughs> he's looking all around his house to see if he's there. Yeah, because right. he was probably, I'm sure, afraid that people would think he was cuckoo. Right. But he said, and he was, he was crying his eyes out. He was as serious as a heart attack that Jesus came to visit him in his That's bedroom. Right. And uh, I, I remember reading the story from Billy Graham about, um, I think it's somewhere over in the Ivory Coast or in Africa somewhere, how that uh, there was missionaries there and the missionaries were under attack from the local, uh, local people there that they were trying to minister to. And, and there was like a war, warlord that was in, uh, in charge of these different warriors and their plan was to kill the missionaries and raid the camp and burn it down. And all the missionaries could do was pray. They were isolated. They couldn't get any help to them. They had to go through the night. And they, they didn't think they were going to make it through the night. And this is in the Billy uh, Graham's book I have on angels. And, um, and the warlords didn't overtake them that night. In fact, they went away. And later, I don't remember how long later, someone was talking to the chief of the warlords. And they said, why, why didn't you take this? Why didn't you take the camp? She said, because it was surrounded by soldiers with flaming fires and spears yeah. encamped all around, the, yeah. all around the encampment. Well, where do you think those come from? Yeah. The, right. the missionaries didn't have any army, mm -hmm. but the, the people saw the, so the uh, God's soldier, angels encamped around about those missionaries and protected them. And that's some more stones that got stacked up right there. Has anyone got any, a quick story about how God's delivered for you that you might be able to use that to stack some stones, Miss Janet? I was talking to Dorothy's uh, sister that just lost her husband, mm -hmm. and I was just telling, you know, she's just having really a hard, hard time, and I was telling her how loving our church was, and that honestly, she needs to get out and, and come to church, you mm -hmm. know, and I said, I look forward to every Sunday, I said, I couldn't have made it the first year without, you know, without the church, and I said, I look forward to coming to church every Sunday to get those hugs and those well wishes and and I said and torment the guys and she <laughs> she started laughing. <laughs> I do that, you know, like, just a little bit. <laughs> Seriously. But I mean I'm praying that she will. She'll she'll come, you know, because you well, you're stacking. Because you're sorrowful, you, you still get the love that, that you need. You're you're stacking some stones right there, Miss Janet, That's because right. you have been through what she's going through. That's right. And you can share. I told her I might. Have, she might have to go get nerve pills. Sure, sure. Her, you, know. you you can share how God's brought you through that, and so that's yes, important. I'm praying that she'll she'll come because I think they enjoy themselves. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else got a quick story you want to share, Miss Julie? That's so much quick. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> so a week after I got married to my husband, my brother-in-law was in a very bad state of mind. Um, he's had trouble passing. Um, he had an argument with his uh, fiance and everything, and he's, he was one into drugs and he drank, and he's also off meds. And he was driving around late at night and basically tried to take his life. He, he took his truck, swerved, knocked it off the road. There was, it was like a country road. There was only one car way ahead of him. And he basically took his truck. He he didn't have a seatbelt on. He got launched out of his rear passenger door or window. Ended up about 100 feet out into a cornfield. And right then and there, um, he was, uh, once he got well enough to speak, he was telling my father-in-law that while he was out there, he was talking to his grandmother, which had passed. And she was telling him things that his dad never told him. Hmm. So as he was repeating the things that she had said to him, the hairs rose in the back of his neck and says, I never told you that. The people that had actually were way down the road saw him flip and called 911. He got airlifted and he's still alive today to take care for his two young girls. That's some great, great stones you can share there. David, if you get a chance, ask David Terrell has a story just like that. If you get a chance, ask him. He was in a bad car accident, probably shouldn't have survived him. And he's got a story that really gets your attention. Anyone else? I love telling the story about how I needed someone to help me at the house. 
and I had to get the house painted and the shutters painted and the house washed, mm -hmm. shower washed, and I couldn't get anybody to do it. Uh, one person said they would do it, but they wanted three hundred ninety dollars just to wash the house. So I was talking to God about it. It was on a Thursday. I was sitting in my chair talking to God about it and telling him, you know, we used to have people in here that would do stuff like that and didn't charge an arm and a leg. And you know, it's just so hard now to find anybody to do anything. And I just talked to him like I talked to you. Mm -hmm. And um, then the next day, I was sitting there. It was about 6:30. I was getting ready to watch the news. I always watch the news at 6:30. And then all of a sudden I jumped up, and it's not like you just jump up and do something like that. But I jumped up and I went, oh, I got to go to the store. I got to get some milk. I need some milk for my coffee in the morning. And I just like changed my clothes and ran out the door, didn't put a necklace or nothing on, and that's unusual. And I went to the store, and I'm at the country market right down the street from my house. And I'm looking at the butter, and this, I turned around and looked, and this guy's like staring at me with his hand on his hip. And I said, uh, do I know you? And he said, I know you. Pointed his finger at me and said, I know you, and I know where you live. And I went, oh, how do you know me? And he said, I painted your shutters 10 years ago. <laughs> And I said, well, I need it again. I said, God put you here. Yes, yes. I told him, I said, God put you here for him to put me and him there right at that same time. And he doesn't even live in the town. Mm -hmm. You know, I know God did that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Anyone else got a story? Yeah. This is kind of just a little bit humorous. So mom grew up knowing the story about Mammy, her grandmother and how important prayer was and that that took care of her family. My mom had to quit school um, before high school to help take care of the kids because my grandmother had to work in the fields. And um, so mom was in charge of all the children. There were seven in the house. And um, my aunt cut her bangs off to her head. And so mom knew exactly what to do. She had my aunt sit down and my mom went behind the door and prayed for Jenny, my aunt Jessie's hair to grow back before her mom got back in town. Well, that didn't work, so you have to <laughs> make sure that your prayers, that your prayers are, are, you know, that was a serious prayer, but not for something that was essential. Yes, that's a good point, Ms. Marcy. Um, so let, let's, I want to read one more a section of verses, still in Joshua 4, but at the end of the chapter, um, starting in verse 20. Joshua chapter 4, verse 20. Just kind of recapping what, took place early in chapter. It says, And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. That's where the memory uh, memorial was. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord that is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. So see, what else this says is that one memorial stack of stone can remind you of other things. He said, you know, that this is, this is where the children of Israel crossed Jordan on dry, dry land, just like they did when they crossed the Red Sea on dry land. And so that, you know, you make some sort of, uh, you know, memory jogger, that's what these were, memory joggers, if you will, with the story attached to it about the faithfulness of God. And as you look back over your life, you, you can be reminded about the other times that God has intervened in your life or for you or for your family. Now, thinking about one more, when Joey got trapped between two fallen trees on a dirt road with a tornado coming by, and uh, here I was, I was in New York, and I was on the phone, and they were, they were telling me that Joey's trapped outside with these two fallen trees, and there's tornadoes in there. I'm scared to death, and I'm, I'm praying my tail off. And uh, I find out that he's okay, and I get home, and I ask uh, Jacob and Leah, so what? How do you think your daddy got through that? And both of them, without skipping a beat, said, Jesus caused those tornadoes to skip right over daddy. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Yes. That's exactly, what, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. And so uh, yesterday, 
Tammy, I don't know if it's in Jacob's class or his mom did. Jacob got a little colored leaf. Of, you know, the leaves are so pretty now. And um, he put it between wax paper and pressed it. And it's just beautiful. And he wrote on it, um, to God and for Mommy. Oh, oh, what it was is, what are you thankful for? Oh, okay. I didn't know and that. He was thankful for God and his mommy. That's wonderful. Yeah. And That's so... Great. Somehow, some way, that even that little boy has some has some um, memory stones stacked up, and you know who knows how that may pay off down the road. I, I hope that there will come a time before I leave this life that I'll get to see him accept the Lord. If not, maybe maybe some of those stones that have been stacked along the way will will help him see. You need help, go to God. And so we need to be about stacking stones. That, that and that's not anything hard. It's not anything laborious. You just. You just tell somebody. You, you make a marker. You tell somebody. You make a reminder for yourself. Put it on a calendar. Put it on, you know, however you can make some sort of memory jogger to remind you of what God is doing and has done for you. And tell your children. Tell your grandchildren. If God bless you. Tell your great-grandchildren. Be sure that they know that. Just like this story has been passed down from generation to generation in Miss Marcy's home. So we need to, we need to stack our own stones. And then... Um, one other way that we can have more faith is to have a deeper, stronger relationship with God. And so, right there, friends. You, you pray and you spend time here because the more you know about God, the more you understand how powerful He is. The more you know about God, the more stones you see that were stacked in the Bible. Not every story has a stack of stones, but you can take any story that just resonates with you and say, I don't want to commit that one to memory. I want to tell somebody. I've read this. I want to tell somebody about this. And uh, James Markham has been working on a reading plan. He said he hopes to have it maybe this weekend uh, to share with folks so that if, if people are interested in reading through the Bible in an organized manner, kind of together, not coming together, but you know, you, everyone can read the same scriptures each week, and he's going to share that with you. I thought, what an appropriate time, because we go through that, and we get closer to God, and we learn more about God, and become more familiar with Him. Um, that's just that much easier to stack those stones, to stack those stones, and build and cultivate that, that relationship with Him. So that's what I got to share with you tonight. Anybody got questions or anything you want to add before we dismiss? I just want to I think God comes to each and every person. My uncle, he was, he was passing, and uh, he I got home from church, and, and his daughter called me, and she said, Janet, Dad wants, wants you to come up to the hospital. And she said, you need to come up because he's really bad. So when I got up there, he said, you know, his wife kept telling him that he wasn't going to pass or anything like that. And, and he looked me straight in the eye and he said, I saw Jesus today. And I said, you did? And he said, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said, he told me I'm going to die. And I said, yeah, you are, sweetie. We, you know, I knew he mm -hmm. was. And I didn't lie to him. And he said, you know what? I'm not afraid. And the last day that he, last Sunday that he lived, he wanted to go to church so badly. And he had his whole family go with him. And that's what he wanted. He wanted the whole family in church. But the cancer had went to his brain, so they had to take him out because it was like he had Tourette's or something, you know, he was screaming out in church and stuff. But, you know, I just can't help but think that that happens to so many people. And mm -hmm. I just pray that they, you know, would have went to him a lot sooner. Right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, the Bible tells us, you know, if it be His will, so we always pray, Lord, if it be Thy will. But remember, those, those one scriptures I read, they don't say anything about God's will. It says, whatsoever you ask. What's, now, we know, we know God's will has to be part of this, but that, that scripture says, whatsoever you ask. And that's why I want my faith to be as strong as possible. And the, one, the one thing you don't want to have, friends, you don't want to have a crisis drop into your life or a crisis drop into your family or friends' lives and you not be as close to God as you should be. You have some sin, yeah. sin in your life that needs to get taken care of. It's like uh, mm -hmm. I, I remember when I got the call that my papa passed away Christmas Eve, and mom and dad were going south to visit uh, to, for the funeral arrangements. And on the way down there, they spent the night in Drybridge, Kentucky, and dad had a heart attack and died. Oh. But mom called, and she, I didn't know how he was doing. She said she was crying and bawling. She said, Joseph, if you never prayed before, pray now. And I dropped to my knees, and I prayed, and I prayed. 
And it wasn't God's will, but that didn't stop me from praying. And I remember afterwards thinking, how terrible it would it be if I'd known I'd done a bunch of things I shouldn't have done, and I couldn't pray with a clear conscience because I had to get things out of my life that, need, that shouldn't have been there. So, All right, church, thanks for coming tonight. God bless you. Hope you have a good week. Pray for the service Sunday. Looking forward to that. And um, let's all stand. We'll be dismissed in prayer. Brother Dave Matheny, would you please dismiss us in prayer? Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, Lord. You were to get to hear. I don't understand, Lord. Live by what you have to do. I'm afraid you dismiss us. We love and care. See us each one home safely.